Right. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for joining. My name is Shannon Walker. I am the Director of Programs here at AUVSI. And on behalf of all of us here at AUVSI, I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Docking into the World of Autonomy. So before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items that we'd like to go over. All of our participant lines will stay muted throughout the webinar. We are recording this program, so you can expect to receive that viewing link to be emailed out within the next week. All of our webinars are available on AUVSI's learning and engagement platform, AVOL. If you are listening to the webinar and you need any technical assistance, please send a note using uh, the chat button at the bottom of your screen. During today's presentation, we are going to open up the session for Q&A. So attendees, you are encouraged to submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Quick note on this, it is a different box than the chat. So just make sure that you're submitting your content questions using the Q&A uh, button instead of the chat. It can be found uh, to the right of the chat button. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. We would really like to thank Frontier Precision Unmanned for their support of today's webinar. And we are really excited to have a great speaker representing the team here with us today, Colin Kemisot, Unmanned Technical Sales at Frontier Precision. So we are certainly in great hands. So with that, Colin, I'm gonna hand it over to you to kick us off. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody to our session today. As mentioned, today's webinar is docking into the world of autonomy, um, one of the, the bright upcoming markets uh, that's still kind of in its infancy stage but starting to get some traction is drone docks. Uh, so we'll be covering some of that today, industries and um, a few different uh, things within the world of docking. So as mentioned, my name is Colin Kamasad. I'm with uh, Frontier Precision, uh, our unmanned division. I am a part 107 pilot. Um, and just for your uh, understanding of, of us here, uh, we do currently have three BV loss waivers. Uh, we do have a part 137 waiver. And then I am uh, Skydio Doc certified. Uh, I'd like to try to keep it as relevant to today's webinar as possible. So. Um, we get lots of questions on who is Frontier Precision. Um, so Frontier has been around for 37 years. Um, we cover a plethora of different uh, verticals from drone UAS um, and underwater to uh, survey uh, precision equipment, um, water resources, mosquito abatement. Um, we, have, we have quite a few different verticals here. Um, our Frontier uh, Precision Unmanned team is pretty well spread across the U.S. Our team currently consists of about 25 different folks, um, all specializing in various verticals. Um, so if, if you have a need for a certain um, vertical that you're trying to or, or solution that you're looking for, um, we probably have somebody on our team that's able to uh, help with that. Um, so just a little bit more about our waivers as we're talking about docks today. Um, we, we currently have three separate waivers, our Skydio dock waiver, our, our DJI dock waiver, um, which you can see both of those in that center image. And then we also have a national BV loss waiver for our Centero, the aircraft on the right. Um, so those are our waivers. We've been doing BV loss for about three years now. Um, in different verticals, which has been great, especially moving into, uh, to uh, docks as they come more uh, prevalent. So uh, how do we get here? How do we get to drone in a dock or in a box and um, kind of what's that timeline look like? So uh, back in 2010 um, is when the military started testing these, these drone in a box is obviously military grade, not the commercial space. Um, in 13, we started to see some of those prototypes uh, come alive. Um, and most of those were uh, integrating current uh, aircrafts by manufacturers into somebody else's dock. So marrying a, a dock system with a drone. Um, in 2016, we started to see early adoption programs, um, kind of like the, the one on the right. That's, that's one of the first docks I remember being commercially available. Um, that was, that was pretty well vetted. In 2017, uh, we start to see regulations start to kind of swirl around this whole concept of drone in a box, uh, autonomous flights um, from the FAA. Uh, in 2018, uh, 
DJI Doc 1 was released. Uh, that was kind of a milestone in, in my mind and, and most of the people um, in my UAS circle, um, just because it was the first uh, complete ecosystem package that uh, somebody could pick up and use um, immediately. Um, in 2020, we started to see those, those regulations start to kind of crack down, get a little bit more mature in, in the, the avenues to successfully um, implement docs. In 2022, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we installed the first DJI dock for remote ops with our partners, Alaska DOT. Um, and then 2024, uh, one of the milestones we, we're starting to see is, is regular approval for dock waivers. It's becoming a, a pretty simple process, allowing for remote operations. So for those of you that uh, this is a brand new concept, what is drone dock or drone in a box? Um, it's basically a system that houses a drone um, and allows it to stay outside all the time, be remotely operated. Um, these, these houses are temperature regulated. So as you can see on the right there uh, with the, the Skydio dock, um, that was actually after um, quite a heavy win winter up here in North Dakota. Um, but they're, they're fully regulated, able to, to melt snow, able to cool down the, the dock inside, um, as well as they have weather sensors within them to tell you what uh, the current surroundings are doing as far as wind and rain. Um, drone docks allow for completely remote operations using computer, um, and these will require either a, a 5G or a Wi-Fi signal. So uh, you know, if it's somewhere in a, a barren wasteland or somewhere real remote, um, something like Starlink is a great option in order to successfully create that link. So drone dock, um, kind of like I was talking about, just to kind of give you a visual of what this looks like. Um, this is DJI's dock one, um, but exactly as you saw, uh, drone dock op opens, uh, drone will launch uh, either autonomously or uh, with a remote pilot. Um, and you're off and running to do whatever uh, task you have uh, at hand. So let's talk a little bit about the drone dock solutions currently in the market. And I'm just going to cover um, kind of the two manufacturers that I would say are most prevalent. There are other manufacturers out there. Um, and there are some that have a complete ecosystem. But these, I would say, are the most popular at the time. Um, so DJI Doc 1, as I mentioned, 2018, that was released. DJI Doc 2, that was just released uh, as of this spring. Um, so we're seeing a, a big uptick in um, DJI Doc 2 because it's just made um, docs so much more accessible to the end user. And then we have Skydio Doc Solutions. Um, obviously, Skydio is an American company. Um, you can see their, their dock solution for exterior on the left there, as well as they uniquely have an uh, interior dock solution called the, the Dock Blight um, for indoor tasks. So um, right now I'm going to run through this video here. We did pre-record this, um, just kind of what the operation looks like from the DJI standpoint. Um, this is running our dock we have um, in our demo fleet at one of our offices. Uh, so as you'll see here, um, we're going to move over to the members tab and you can have a, a plethora of different members within your organization. As you can see, we have uh, almost everybody on our, our doc uh, platform here. Um, we'll go to our test site. And a few things to note here. So right now we're looking at where the doc is actually uh, sitting. This green line you'll see is a geofence. So this is a uh, an area where the, the drone will not be able to, to go outside of. Um, some of you are probably familiar with geofencing. And then that little red box on, and, and we'll we'll scroll back here a little bit here. Um, this, this little red box right here, this is a no-fly zone. So we have set that up. Um, that isn't set by the FAA, but we set it as a no-fly zone um, for our, our test case. So you, here you, right now you can see we're looking at the, the dock camera to give us a view of uh, what's going on around the dock itself. Take a look at weather. Um, that little circle in the center there, that is actually the rain gauge. So that would tell us um, if there's rainfall currently happening. And then above that camera, um, we also have a, a weather station that would tell us wind. Um, currently, right now, we're going through some pre-planned missions that we have for this dock. So we've we've tested a variety of different things. So you can see area scan right now, but we do have an overwatch uh, option 
an orbit option around the building. Um, so depending on your uh, task at hand, you can set up a variety of different tasks for this to do autonomously and repetitively um, so that you can get consistent data. Right now we're just saying return to home altitude and then um, upon completion, what is its task? Um, right now we have that just set to return back to the dock itself. All right, so back in our dock view here, here in a second, um, you will see, uh, see us move to the aircraft view. Um, you can see the docks opening right now to um, allow the, the M30T to be seen. We're now gonna move into aircraft control. Um, so you will be able to then see the FPV camera on the drone itself, as well as um, we will do it here in a second, but you'll be able to move to the, uh, the payload camera um, which on the, in this case would be a wide angle lens, a, um, a thermal, a 640 by 512 thermal, and then a telephoto lens as well for inspection purposes. So right now we have launched the drone. Um, again, this is all recorded, um, but we have launched the drone. It's now going to start that mission that you see on the left there. Um, we did cancel the task the the task here just because of um, time sake, but um, as you can see right now, we're we're manually flying it around, um, and this is something you can do remotely from anywhere in the world. So uh, as you just saw on the top of the screen there, Sean has now taken uh, payload control. So one of the unique things, especially for DFR programs, um, you know, allowing an operator or even somebody using inspection to be able to um, easily navigate that payload without having to worry to fly the aircraft itself. Um, we see this more in DFR programs where they're trying to pursue or get to a certain place um, that isn't routine. And that allows a secondary operator to be using that, that, that payload to you know, look for suspects or search and rescue operations or whatever it may be, um, which is, is nice to just keep people focused on the task at hand. So right now we just, uh, we just told the doc to um, pause and we'll be doing a return to home um, protocol here um, very shortly. So you'll see it move back over top of the dock, um, that dock open, and then it land itself. Uh, the DJI dock one is a bit unique in the sense of how uh, the charger works. So this will charge on its own, no need for user input. Um, but as you see this dock land, what will what you'll see is it'll actually push um, push some of the 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 drone to the center of the dock over the charging pad itself, just like a wireless charging pad like you've seen before. So right now we've we've gone into that mission. Um, they're going to do a short run here, um, kind of just showing what uh, you know. For instance, a mapping mission would look like. Um, you can see Nathan just pulled up the uh, the weather station there showing that everything is normal. Um, no weather according to the dock has come in. Obviously, it's always recommended to check uh, wherever the dock's at, check your, your nearest weather station um, or have one on site so you're able to get a, a good thorough reading of what's exactly going on or what weather's coming in. So Nathan just uh, did return to home protocol. So as you can see, he's currently pointing at that alternative landing site. Um, so in the instance that the dock wouldn't open or it wouldn't be able to return to the dock itself, we do have a, a fail safe set um, or a safe area where the dock can return um, and land in proximity. And we know that it's a, a site where it can land safely. So uh, right now, as I mentioned, we're in return to home protocol. Um, so you'll see the dock open as we lose elevation here. Uh, 
And then as it lands, you can kind of see those square boxes on um, either end of or, or the four corners of where the dr drone just landed. Um, that will then uh, push the dock or the, or the drone itself into the center, allowing it to get over those charging pads that I mentioned earlier. Each drone dock has a little bit way, a uh, different way of landing. Um, so like drone dock two um, is, is a little bit different of a system. They're not using uh, the pushers anymore. Um, and then Skydio itself uh, is a little bit different system as well. Um, here now you'll see the docks closing up and we're looking inside the dock. Um, so you'll see those, those red lights within. Um, and from there, we're now able to put that data or the mission that we've uh, we've just uh, captured. We can now process that online. So you choose or see your videos or photos or whatever it may be. Um, so all that can be done right within the cloud. Right now, he's just looking at that image we took. Um, so you you would be able to do some inspections or um, you know send it to the proper people in order for them to take a look at you know maybe something within your inspection uh, caused a, a red flag. You can then immediately send that to whomever's the the proper person, um, and they're then able to um, you know take a look at it. All right. So we're gonna move on here. All right, so applications and industry. Um, I tried to keep this as general as possible because we can really get in the weeds. Um, I really feel, and I know our team feels that drone in a box can really be used in any scenario. Um, and it has a lot of use cases, but I tried to, to divide this kind of into four different places and just touch on, on a little bit of each of them. Um, so obviously public safety is a, a large use case right now. That would, that would be where I think we've seen, um, the, the most folks, um, you know, picking up these programs. Um, so obviously there's a lot of different applications from search and rescue, surveillance and monitoring, disaster assessment, assessment response, hazmat, crime scene, public health, uh, border security and environmental monitoring, um, just to name a few. So, um, everybody's looking at you know, making the response time so much faster. And this is this is a way for um, these entities to do so. So you might have heard over the last year, um, DFR or drone as first responder. Um, basically what the concept is, is the drone will be um, released from the dock to a certain location um, that a 99 or 911 dispatcher has sent it to. Um, this will allow for folks on site uh, or when they arrive on site to have a better idea of what's going on. Um, we see this use case a lot in fire. Um, we see it also being used a lot in response for police officers. Um, one of the big things is, is allowing those police officers or, or your, your first responders on the ground to focus on what they're doing rather than needing, um, you know, one of their own to be a pilot on scene. So just putting more more uh, more power to uh, the first responders to do their job, and giving those operations to a command center or incident command at a remote location. All right, public safety overwatch. This is another use case we see a lot of of drone docks being used for. Um, obviously, bigger crowds are always hard to uh, get a good eye on if you're not in the sky. Um, so concerts, festivals, parades, sporting events, um, these are all things that we've seen drones be used for before, uh, but now at a more automated capacity, um, allowing to overwatch those scenarios. The other scenarios we're seeing a lot of is breaching contacts, um, barricade contacts, and obviously search and rescue. So, um, you know, if this allows, uh, you know, for a breaching situation for those SWAT teams to focus 
maybe on one side of or multiple sides of a building, allowing the drone to cover another side. So uh, Skydio did a really good job of kind of, you know, showing this concept of what this looks like. So as of right now, a lot of departments have specialized units that will have drones. They'll go out and uh, a, a certain pilot, uh, typically in this scenario, a police officer will launch the drone and go do a crime scene reconstruction. Um, patrol led deployments. Uh, so this would be a specific uh, person out doing, you know, basically patrolling and, and running those drone operations themselves. And then finally, this is where the future is. And this is where um, certain entities like Chula Vista, uh, Forsyth County that I'll talk about here in a little bit um, are currently going, but allowing those drone in, the, in a boxes to deploy those, uh, those aircrafts um, to sites that they're needed uh, based on 911 dispatch calls. Um, this will allow for the police officer on the ground pursuing the suspect to stay focused on pursuing that suspect. This will allow for um, police officers in a crash scene to focus on directing traffic and not necessarily have to worry about the drone um, aspect of things, as well as uh, something that's a little more near and dear to my heart um, with, with fire is allowing um, those first responders to see what the fire looks like before even arriving on scene, giving them the chance to make a game plan before they even get there. So as I mentioned, DFR programs today, um, these are kind of uh, a few of the ones that are most prevalent. Uh, everybody, if, if you're in the DFR space or even if you've been following Drone in a Box, um, Chula Vista, you can go to their website. They have a lot of good information on their DFR program. Um, but these guys have been doing it the longest that I'm aware of. Um, they've also, you know, kind of pushed through some of the regulations that uh, others have gotten st uh, stood up on or, or held back by. Um, and kind of some interesting stuff on the left there is the number of calls that they've done off their DFR program. So you can find all this information directly on their website. Um, the other uh, entity that we've seen and we work with uh, is Forsyth County out of North Carolina. Um, they are very progressive in what they're doing and they have a, a pretty extensive operation with their DFR program. So let's move on to inspection and monitoring. Um, this is probably a little more uh, commercially what people will be using these drone in a boxes for. Um, and I'll show a little bit more of what we did with Alaska DOT. Uh, but these are some of the industries that we have, uh, we have used drone in a box for, and we're seeing a lot of traction within. Uh, Department of Transportation, we're seeing that for a lot of different avenues from um, simply dam mo or uh, bridge monitoring and construction to uh, avalanche mitigation. Um, mines, this is another uh, another vertical that we're seeing a lot of use for. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what they're doing here in a second. Uh, telecommunication, utilities, uh, bridge and dam monitoring, um, you know, overwatch with construction, oil and gas. There's some new regulations coming out around oil and gas later this year. Um, so these are all verticals that we're seeing uh, drone in a box be heavily used within. So um, what are they using them for? Um, you know, specifically in the inspection and monitoring place or, or, or side of things, we're seeing uh, progress flights. So, um, you know, construction's happening, but continually monitoring the progress of that site itself. Uh, routine inspections around, uh, you know, maybe it's a substation um, mapping, uh, again, for some of the avalanche mitigation that we'll touch on here in a second, emergency response if there's a natural disaster, um, you know, deploying this drone so that um, the proper people above can, can see what's going on site rather than, um, you know, just getting relayed information. And then obviously security, this is a big one that we're seeing as well. Um, you know, security of perimeters, um, you know, we're seeing traction within prisons, we're seeing traction um, in a variety of different places where the drone in a box is allowing for them to do routine, um, routine flights on a normal basis. Uh, mines, so I wanted to touch on one uh, vertical within here, specifically mines. Uh, what are we seeing them use uh, this, this technology for? Um, so we're seeing them do, they're moving earth all the time, right? They're using these giant drag lines. Um, so routinely doing stockpile uh, volumes or, or calculations 
um, inspecting that giant equipment, the, the drag lines, the booms on the drag lines, um, inspection of their safety barriers and roadways, as well as helping overview and direct uh, the way the operation's going. These are all things that within the mining space we're seeing drone in a box being used for. Um, I know we have certain mines already operating six to seven different docks, um, you know, usually related to uh, separate pits or se separate areas that they're mining within. Um, so path to utilities, this is going to be more based around the, the utility substation, um, power lines, things like that. Um, but again, Skydio did a really good job of showing kind of where uh, drone in a box is, is becoming a, a, a very key tool in the toolbox. Um, so as of right now, um, you know, most folks, I'm sure folks on this, this webinar um, have you know, their first, their first line people that go out and they do these inspections by hand, looking at what they need to look at um, and allowing for those experts to be out, um, you know, making sure things are good day to day. Um, I'm sure some of you are now doing pilot drone programs where you have uh, maybe a part 107 pilot that goes out and gathers this data, brings it back, and then that's digested within your organization. And then how do you get to a condition-based assessment, something routine, um, something that would allow uh, you guys to get uh, the best ROI, best data, um, all in all. Um, so you have your frontline staff now, part 107 trained, allowing them to uh, do those proper assessments that they need to do. And then finally, um, your decision confidence goes very high once we get to drone in a box where it's doing a routine inspection allowing you to get that data without uh, tying up your folks and allowing them to do their other day-to-day -day tasks. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our Alaska DOT project. As I mentioned earlier, this was the first DJI doc um, running within the US. Um, so we were very honored to, to partner with them. Um, it really put the doc through its, its paces. And I'll show you a video here in a little bit. Um, I'm not a guy usually that likes to do videos and webinars, but in this case, I felt it really shows kind of what the doc's capable of in, in those different use cases that it can be used for. So uh, we're, we've been working with Alaska DOT for quite some time. Um, one of the uh, issues that they have was avalanche mitigation or, or natural disasters being caused um, during their day that, that would shut down the roadways. So um, we were tasked with, uh, you know, how do we routinely do these inspections and know when to go out and, and blast for um, those avalanches to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to keep the roadway open. So um, benefits to Alaska DOT, they, they're a very progressive group up there, um, access cutting edge technology. Um, we did some hands-on training and, and uh, demonstrations with them. And then we enhanced their decision-making capabilities by allowing the, their, um, you know, their uh, department heads to make decisions as these uh, scenarios came along. So we'll move along here and I'll just play this video quick. Volume. All right, so we'll just talk through what's going on here. Um, since we don't have volume. So as I mentioned, um, their big scenario was using this for avalanche mitigation. Uh, they want to remotely be able to control the dock in order to um, get day-to-day -day data. So we did a mapping scenario with the drone in the box. Uh, we partnered with them feeling that um, not only were they great partners for us, but they would uh, put the dock through its, its heaviest paces for us to, you know, have that that use case that scenario for other users um as you can see there that was a, a controlled avalanche but as of right now they are currently working through um mapping the actual side of the avalanche or, or the mountain itself um, to get volumes of um what needs to be you know mitigated in that that certain area
We did use UGCS on this project in order to map out a lot of these different areas. Um, some required us to do a, a manual flight in order to get elevations and make sure that the missions were going to be ran um, as they wanted to see fit. One of their biggest concerns was um, obviously in Alaska, they get some pretty inclement weather, um, but being allow or, or allowing, having the dock being able to um, run its run its course even through um, inclement weather. Um, the M30T specifically is weather rated um, and they did run it for about 12 months before this video was actually made. Um, so we had a pretty good uh, use case while this uh, this project was going on, they did have some flooding go on um, in northern Alaska, um, and they used the dock and moved it actually up to that site to allow their leadership to see what was going on, uh, which was a pretty cool thing to um, see the dock be used for. So they did daily missions of this area um, and they actually used uh, ArcGIS, you'll, you'll see it here in a moment, um, of them showing the before and after of, of uh, this emergency response. DJI Dock 1 is a little heavier, so they did use a truck to get it up there. Um, they planned the missions, they could tell where their personnel was at, um, and then again, do those routine uh, flights as well as live stream flights uh, so that their leadership, if there's certain areas that they wanted to see specifically, um, they could. So here's the before and after of, of what they were monitoring. As you can see, uh, water went up pretty substantially, um, especially threatening that roadway, uh, which was the whole purpose for um, them sending the dock up there for emergency response. Here you'll see we had a variety of different missions in those areas planned um, so they could monitor separate corridors, have the drone do separate flights, um, and ultimately uh, you know, get good data on um, snowpack on those those mountainsides. And I will flip to the next one. Um, I'll give you guys a minute here, but if you do want to see um, that video you just saw with volume on it, which uh, it, it probably does sound a lot better than me uh, voicing over it, um, highly recommend it, um, but it shows really kind of the capabilities of Doc and where it can be used today. Um, as I mentioned, we used Alaska DOT because they pushed it through its paces in both inclement weather um, as well as at elevation. So um, it was a great use case and, and uh, well worth uh, your time to, to take a watch of that video. So the other thing I wanted to talk about that we're seeing a lot of use case in now is drone delivery. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have heard about DroneUp or, or Zipline or some of those different uh, drone delivery service providers, um, but it's actually expanding even beyond that, um, which is pretty interesting. So as of right now, we're seeing a lot of, you know, the bigger box stores start to use drones for delivery purposes. Um, but they're usually within a smaller um, confined space, two to three miles, depending on the area. Um, some drone delivery providers are starting to go a bit further, um, but those are kind of the restraints. Um, the medical supplies delivery, we saw a big uptake in this during COVID, um, allowing for aircraft to, to move uh, vaccines or other medical supplies from facility to facility. And we're now seeing that start to be picked up again. Um, we have a lot of use cases within rural areas where um, it makes more sense for a drone to fly a direct path, or there might be uh, in a scenario that I'm currently working with, there's a body of water in between um, the medical uh, facility and a separate town. So um, lots of different use cases on the medical front. 
And one of the other use cases that we're working with right now is, is Duke Medical, um, their AED delivery program. Um, it's one of the first programs I've heard about doing AED delivery. Their goal is to deliver an AED within five minutes, and they estimate that it has a 30 to 40% higher survival rate than uh, a traditional method being um, a first responder showing up on scene um, or different things like that. So pretty interesting use case. I think we'll see um, the future. We'll see this progress quite a bit more. Um, we're already seeing it you know, move within facility to facility but um, really seeing a, a public aspect of where this can really um, help, help, help the public itself. So one of the other things I wanted to touch on as we start to close out our time here is the regulations. This is probably one of the areas that are most confusing or maybe a little more nerve wracking for most folks. Um, there are kind of two ways that we can currently run a dock. Obviously a visual observer, you can always run with a visual observer. Um, you know, having somebody outside with a remote in their hand operating the drone itself. Um, that would still require part 107. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm unaware of any, um, you know, drones under that, that, uh, that class that would allow for a recreational um, use case. But, um, you know, part 107 obviously is, is, a, is line of sight. But really, where the rubber meets the road, I think everybody wants to be able to fly beyond visual line of sight. So how do I get a waiver? How do I put this program into play? Um, and that's a that's a great question, something we get a lot from or a question we get a lot from a lot of different folks. Um, so the waiver process needs to go through the FAA, and I have a couple slides on that here, different waivers that you get, shielded ops, non-shielded ops. Um, and this is is something we could probably dive into 45 minutes on it all in itself. Um, but to get a uh, beyond visual line of sight waiver, the operator has to sit, submit an application and a safety case with the FAA. Um, and the FAA is currently working on beyond visual line of sight rules. Um, you know, this slide specifically says mid 2025 to end 2025. Um, I can't say I would be surprised if we see it sooner. I can't see, I'd say I'd be surprised if we see, it, see that later. Um, but many of you have probably heard about Part 108 and how that's been floated around for quite some time now. So as of right now, today, um, we do need a, a BV loss waiver in order to achieve um, remote oper fully remote operations like we've talked about today. Um, there are custom waiver scenarios out there, and we're starting to see this more and more. Um, so having a secondary sensor on the dock or on a building that would allow for you to unlock the airspace above it. Um, I know there's there's certain cameras out there that that's all they do is they look at the horizon monitoring for aircrafts. Um, as soon as that camera sees something that um, it doesn't like being an aircraft or otherwise, it'll send the drone into a return to home protocol or uh, it could send it into a loiter protocol where it'll stay in a specific area doing a, a, a circle. Um, but the more sensors you have, the more airspace we've seen unlocked, um, you know, up to 400 feet. And I know that um, in different scenarios, we even have a manufacturer that's um, unlocked a thousand feet. So um, the FAA likes to see risk mitigation. So all the redundancies that you can do to guarantee that that drone is in a safe environment, as well as the protocols in case something was to go sideways. Um, these are all things to keep in mind in that waiver process. Um, the other thing we see a lot with, with docs themselves is COAs or cert, uh, Certificate of Authorization. If you're uh, unfamiliar with this concept, it's basically allowing um, the drone operator to have access to particular things within an airspace. Um, we see this a lot within public safety entities, but we're seeing also in utility entities and other things like that where they might be within town, it's heavily restricted. Um, but they need to do their operation. So getting a COA um, allows them to um, get that, that access in order to do those operations. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about here is we talked a little bit about uh, the waiver types. Um, and this is just a chart kind of going through some of those. So you have a visual observer on site. Um, we have our shielded standard ops. Um, so that would be no visual observers. Um, and no equipment on site. Typically, the waivers we're seeing right now that are easily going through are typically at a 50-foot AGL, um, and a lot of times it's 50-foot within a structure. So if you're doing an inspection within 
um, let's say a set of, of power lines um, staying within 50 feet of that structure is what the, the waiver is bound to. Um, like I said, we're starting to see a lot more of the shielded non-critical infrastructure ops come out um, where they're able to start getting that 400 feet. And I'm sure in the near future, we'll be seeing um, people even push those bounds beyond that. Um, it'll be really cool to see whenever that comes out. Um, and then obviously at the bottom, you see the DA equipment, um, additional operations. So these, these are additional sensors that would allow for um, the dock to achieve some of those other um, verticals that we talked about. I appreciate everybody's time today. I know we will be doing a Q&A now. Um, and I know that was a lot to unpack, um, but if you do have any questions for us, um, we can definitely be reached at UAS at Frontier Precision Unmanned, uh, or FrontierPrecision.com, I'm sorry. Um, and we'd be more than happy to, to help you or your operation. Well, all right, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Colin. So as, as Colin said, if you have a question, go ahead and click that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to get it submitted. We already have a few that have been rolling in, so I am going to jump right in and get started. Um, starting off, building right off of what you were just talking about, the waiver piece. So you you were talking about that. Do do you need a waiver in order to operate a dock? Um, so you don't need a waiver to operate a dock, um, but that's really where uh, you're going to see the most benefit in a dock is allowing it to autonomously do um, do its operations without having personnel on site um, or allowing a single operator to go to multiple docks and do operations maybe as their sole job. Um, but overall, that's beyond visual line of sight is the real um, the real key to the, the operation itself. But um, no, you don't need a, a beyond visual line of sight waiver in order to operate a dock. Perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, the, the next question that came in asks, like, what if you need to clean a lens or check props? Is, is there a sort of maintenance stop to quickly do that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the FAA does require inspection of the aircraft before taking off. Um, both DJ and Skydio, and I know a couple others are using cameras in order to fulfill that need. Um, so Skydio will have a camera within the dock that you can actually do an inspection, zooming in on, on props, zooming in on different components that uh, you, you have to check before flight. Um, and that will fulfill that need. Now, if a camera or something has a smudge on it or you need to clean it, um, really the only way to take care of that is to physically go out and, and wipe off the, the lens itself. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so on on either of the docks that, that you were talking about today, does the dock act as an RTK base? And do you need to survey the dock location in order to get more accuracy? So um, you don't have to survey the dock itself. Um, so our, our DJI dock down in Brighton is running off a of virtual reference station. Um, so that, that dock is connected to, um, to a network at all times, getting real-time corrections. Um, you could do a PPK workflow as well. So if you wanted to have targets set out and routinely um, you know, bring that data in as your dock went out and surveyed, you sure could do that. Otherwise, um, I know there's claims that RTK is accurate enough. Uh, we deal with a lot of survey firms and uh, those types of verticals on our side. So we always recommend ground control. But to answer your question, um, it won't act as an RTK base. It's getting corrections from a different correction source. All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question came in was around compatibility. Um, so can can you speak to what UAVs are compatibility with these docks? Yeah, so um, uh, as of right now, there's there's quite a few different manufacturers of docks themselves. Um, I know Watts Prism has been being used um, quite substantially for a while with uh, drone up. I know first eyes um, docks are compatible with those. Um, the most, like the, the docks we see most compatible with a manufacturer, typically DJI, um, as most people know, the, they, they have the largest market share. 
and their their API on the back end seems to be the the most compatible with folks. Um, but we're starting to see um, some other aircrafts be put into docks as well. Um, VTOLs, those are kind of a big topic on the horizon right now. Um, so most manufacturers, uh, based on whatever system they're running on the back end, whether that's Arterian um, or Ardu Pilot or something along those lines, most uh, most dock manufacturers will incorporate that into their workflow themselves. So if there is a special dock that you're looking for and you're wanting to combine the aircraft with the dock, um, definitely check with the manufacturer to see if if they're able to integrate your aircraft into their dock. All right, perfect. Good advice. Thank you. Um, it looks like I see one more question. So a plug to the audience to, to get any uh, final questions in before we wrap up uh, to get those asked. Um, but another question that came in asks, are the majority of your RFCOM cellular provided LTE? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of 5G link happening. So LTE connections. Um, I know we do have some 4G or, or just LTE connections, but 5G, 4G, we're seeing that quite a bit. Um, otherwise, we do have a lot of um, radio based from the dock itself. So depending on what dock system you go with, um, there are those two different ways to operate the dock. Um, and depending on the manufacturer itself. Um, so definitely something to look into if you're looking for beyond visual line of sight operations at a further distance from the dock, um, probably those LTE or 5G uh, systems would be a better use case. Awesome, thank you. And we do have some more questions sneaking in. So earlier in your presentation, I know you talked about being in Alaska and North Dakota. Can you expand a little bit about the power requirements and sources um, that are that are required here, especially in these inclement weather areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in these inclement weather areas, they do the docks do take a little bit more juice um, in order to kick on those heaters that I talked about. Um, they're heating elements on the top of the dock uh, because that's really the place of concern. Um, so most of them will just run a 120 volt, um, just your standard outlet, um, but some of them will be, need to be hardwired in um, to something with a little more amperage. So typically like a 240. Um, but again, that kind of de depends on the manufacturer itself. Um, but as I mentioned in, in the smaller um, dock space, uh, a, a standard 120 is is typically what uh, is being used now. All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, and, and another question that I see here is, what's the potential for operating docks or fleets of, for fleets of synchronized drones? Um, the, the potential is definitely there. Um, we're seeing uh, one thing I didn't talk about that that is being used now um, was kind of introduced, but I think people have had in their head for quite some time is, is dock hopping. Um, but any of these docks, I mean, you could have seven, eight docks and remote into any single one and operate it at any given time. Um, the waiver might look a little different depending on the area you're within, um, but we already have uh, larger entities purchasing, you know, those six, seven dock amounts and having an operation fleet um, being commanded by one person. So it's definitely here. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll see more of that um, as this progresses along. Um, but yeah, today that, that operation is already happening. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so that, that wraps up the questions that came in from the audience. And before we close for the today, Colin, do you have any kind of closing comments or thought, final thoughts you'd like to, to leave us with? No, I don't. Um, I think uh, drone in a box, I would say, is is one of um, kind of the hottest talks in the UAS space right now. Um, so if you do have any questions or need any help, um, you know, in the waiver process or setting up an operation or whatever it may be, um, myself and, and my team have pretty extensive, uh, extensive time in that industry or in, in those verticals. So we'd be more than happy to help you. Perfect. Thank you. And I am going to sneak one more question. And that just came sure. in um, yeah. back about the RF comms. So continuing on that, what max range are you realizing with the 2.4 gigahertz that provides robust comms? 
Um, so we haven't tested it um, probably as far as people would like. Uh, we have tested uh, about three miles is the range we've gotten from remote comms from the dock itself. Um, and that varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, but with the 5G, uh, realistically, as long as you're within cellular range, um, it would be an unlimited uh, range as long as you're connected to a, a 5G network. Um, so we're seeing that. Currently, right now, there's only a few aircrafts out there running off 5G. Um, the Skydio X10 would be one of those, but um, they're able to run, you know, for infinite uh, amount of time as long as your your battery stays. So um, back to the the RF comment, yeah, three three miles is what I would say safely um, from the dock itself if you're running RF off the dock, but if you're running it uh, 5G unlimited. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your for your time today for this great discussion. So on behalf of myself and AUVSI, thanks Colin for today and thanks to Frontier Precision Unmanned for their support of this webinar. So attendees, as I mentioned at the beginning, you are going to receive a link to this webinar recording within the next few days. So all of our webinar recordings are now available on AUVSI's learning and engagement platform AVIL. So when you visit AVIL, make sure you look around and see all that it has to offer. So if you have any additional questions or comments for our team, you can reach out to us at education at auvsi.org. So lastly, today's program is copyrighted by AUVSI with all rights reserved. So once again, thank you all for being here with us today, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.